Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. I'm Brink. And this is Belle. And we're going to talk about lots of random things today. So, yes, the game in the background is Hearthstone, and I realize a lot of y'all aren't tremendous Hearthstone fans, but that is something that Belle and I can play while we're talking on about things. So, if you don't like this game, minimize it. Stick the window in the background, get it away from your site, but go ahead and tune in, because we might just discuss something that interests you, and I would love to hear any feedback that you have on this whole thing. So, stick around with us, if you please. We're going to have a little bit of fun. All right, so we're going to play the Tavern Brawl, and this one is ever so slightly complicated, but uh, I think I've pretty well figured it out, and I think Bell has a fairly good grasp on it, so we're just going to pick a character and launch into it. You got one picked out? Yes. Awesome. Well, then, I am probably behind the times. Let's go with Druid. I would like to point out that even though I watched and sort of figured out this tavern brawl, Brink got to play it like three times, which means that he's <laughs> at an advantage here. Maybe, maybe just yes. a little, but yes. okay. Anyway, so this game, we're basically going to build up our decks um, as we play. You start with like six cards, I think, um, and you go from there by random draw. So what are our random topics for today. Well, I guess if we've picked topics, they aren't exactly random, are they? Well, I mean, they're still random if they're not themed, I would guess. This is probably accurate. Oh, look, you played a chicken. I'm so surprised. <laughs> no, so I was reading this Forbes article the other day talking about the 15 richest YouTubers. Oh, I can't talk and read cards at the same time. Hang on. Well, I think we know who the richest one is, obviously. Right, yeah, so that's easy. But, um, no, I was surprised by the article because it was, I mean, it was pretty decent. I wasn't really surprised by any of the YouTubers that they mentioned. But um, they got to talking about PewDiePie, of course, who's the richest one. And the article talked about how intensely private he is and how he almost never does press stuff and said something basically to the effect of, well, you should get used to it because that's how it is being famous. And I was kind of outraged for him and also a little bit in shock because clearly the reporter who was writing the article doesn't realize that YouTube famous is completely different from, like, actor famous, where, yes, if you want to promote your movie or something, you do have to go and talk to the press. But on YouTube, he gets way more views than the Forbes website probably ever will, and he doesn't <laughs> have to go talk to the press. Traditional to... media is not as big a deal as it used to be anymore. Yeah, and it's not. I've seen this point brought up a couple of different places, and it does strike me as hilarious because you can pull... Uh, news articles referring to YouTube people, and as a whole, they're mostly derisive. Like, um, they refer to people on YouTube as quirky, and they behave like children for laughs and views, and yada, 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 but in reality, these as people... As comedians haven't been doing that for ages. Yeah. In reality, <laughs> these people are getting massive astronomical audiences, and they're making some of them in the millions of dollars a year off of this. And it seems kind of silly to uh, be derisive about something like that. Almost makes you wonder if they aren't uh, maybe overcompensating a little bit because they're terrified. <laughs> yeah, probably. At the very least, they clearly don't understand it. Which is something Brink and I were talking about recently. It's funny if you spend enough time on the internet, YouTube being... Um, of course, an obvious example for us, but you don't realize how um, how little other people understand it. So, especially we, people over age thirty five or forty. But sometimes even people our own age don't really get it. So it becomes an interesting experience where we start talking about YouTube or other internet things, and it's like. Oh, this person has no idea what I'm talking about. Okay. Kind of mildly frustrating at some points, but whatever, we'll take it. It It is interesting how things evolve over time, though, because, um, you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have predicted that, um, that a site like YouTube 
would have as many or more people watching it than traditional like TV, listening to the radio, doing that kind of thing. Um, nobody would have thought that the audience would be there for this kind of thing. But, you know, it, it happens. And then when stuff like this happens, of course, people try to adapt. Um, and you end up with your advertisers adjusting their ad revenue models to fit this instead of traditional TV. And one thing that I think you had looked at uh, maybe a week ago or so was an article about how basically web design is shifting towards purposely being addictive um, to try to get people to stay on sites for longer, to click on things, to drive ad revenue. And it, it was just a really interesting topic of conversation, how they're you know kind of turning everything to cater to that side of the internet. Right, I mean, it's not even, it's frankly beyond the point of, um, like, the web's not moving that direction. It basically is purely designed for addiction and for getting people to click. It's a really interesting article, though, when you talk about whether or not that's ethical <laughs> um, <laughs> or whether or not we should blame people for if they're being, um, you know, if they're being basically manipulated to click or to spend extra time on a site, is it really their fault if they become addicted? Um, which is, I, I don't know, it's a really complicated ethical question, but yeah, I think, I think part of the reason that um, YouTube and other sites like this are so popular though, it does have to do with the generational difference because millennials, as a, I mean, in general, this it's not a rule, but we're more interested in authenticity. We don't trust corporations. We don't trust big media. So um, a millennial is way more likely to believe some random person making videos out of their bedroom um, <laughs> than they are to believe. A terrifyingly yeah. accurate representation. <laughs> well, it's true. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, to me, the bigger the bigger problem I have with it is that there is this huge muddled up gray area. And a lot of times if you try to argue against one thing and you let other things slide, then you get into the whole conversation of, well, exactly how much of this is the government supposed to regulate? Exactly how much of this is completely fine and we shouldn't worry about? You know, because you have things like uh, the lottery in the United States. The lottery is apparently totally fine to have, but then there's regulation on gambling and there's regulation on, um, or, or it's straight up illegal in some places or like fantasy sports and that kind of thing. And then at the same time, you have companies that are specifically designing addictive games like Candy Crush, um, where no, you're not gambling for more money. You're not going to get anything back out of it, but they're cultivating addictive behavior um, that keeps you there spending money, keeps you in place. It There's so much there. It, it's just a weird area of conversation. Yeah, and that's the biggest problem to me, is that you do have things like Candy Crush Saga or other similar games with all of these little microtransactions that you, they are. They are literally designed to be addictive. It's a neurological thing, and um, there's no regulation on that. So to me, like the fact that the government is cracking down so hard on things like fantasy sports, but then not on other things do? like what games... Just it's that's just a double standard there. Well, even <laughs> that it it can potentially get even more muddled than that because you can get into the discussion where even Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing, those are those cultivate addictive behaviors too. Because if if you remember, Facebook underwent a restructure a few years back where they went from a. Um, they went from a format where you had a timeline that was chronological and it updated as people posted. And they shifted from that to the news feed where they showed you things that they thought you wanted to see. 
Which meant that if you go to Facebook and you leave for five minutes and you come back again, there will be different content. You know, you'll see two or three different things at the top of your newsfeed than you had before. And that encourages you to always, oh, I need to go back and check this. Oh, I need to go look at this thing. Um, it, it keeps you coming back more and more rapidly because you're expecting something different. So. Yes, but I think part of the reason no one has been too worried about that is because in theory, I mean, in theory, that's not ruining anyone's life. I mean, I suppose it could be in an extreme example <clears throat> if someone, um, you know, if someone was just constantly on Facebook and they let everything else in their life go downhill, but... Um, That'd be a pretty extreme case. <laughs> it would be, ex yeah, it would be very extreme. So oh, that's, that's not why nice. No one has rushed to do anything about that specifically. I think. No, and, and I'm not saying that they should. I'm just saying that if you start doing something about cultivating addictive behavior in games, then the argument could be made that. Uh, well, that's a hard choice. <laughs> The argument could be made that you should go after websites too, because that's not fair. Yeah. Basically. I think it's a. It, I think it's a very thorny topic, and frankly, I don't think anyone is seriously going to tackle it soon. No, I, I think you're right on that one. Speaking of thorny topics, I came across an article in Popular Science um, a little. Uh, I don't know, a week ago maybe. Um, it was about, I can actually pull it up right here, and I have the names. Where is it? Uh, Humay, H-U-M-A-I. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that one. Um, but basically, this person is, well, that company. The person in charge is Josh uh, Bocanegra. Um, he is wanting to explore immortality and resurrection through artificial means. And this is something, the the biomechanics field and the field of uh, gene editing, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard CRISPR has come up in the news quite a bit recently um, as far as, you know, people editing genes in order to eliminate disease, bring forth de desirable features, that kind of thing. For science fiction, for a long, long time now, People have debate, debated the how ethical it is to modify human beings. But we haven't really had that as a reality. Like, it's not something that's actually happening. And within the next couple of years, the way things are going, this is something that we're going to have to be worrying about in the very, very near future. Um, well, taunt is annoying. Let me get that. There we go. Anyway, so specifically in this context, um, these people are wanting to, when a person passes away, they want to uh, flash freeze the brain, use cryogenics to preserve it. Um, and then they want to, within the next 30 years, use every means at their disposal, whether that is current technology or things that will develop over the course of the next 30 years. They want to build an artificial human body, one that is capable of supporting a biological brain, at which point they would uh, introduce, start introducing these brains that they have frozen over the years into these bodies and experimenting with exactly what they can do to essentially bring them back to life, to have a human brain in a artificial body that could potentially live forever if you can keep the brain alive. Hmm. Cue creepy music. <laughs> uh, yeah. You would think that the study of science fiction would have taught us that maybe living forever is a horrible idea, but <laughs> apparently not. Yeah, well, it is it is fiction. I don't think they're ever gonna get a uh, get a biological entity to live forever, as far as humans are concerned. Because 
there's always going to be something that fails, the potential for damage, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But to me, I'm wondering why they're going about it in this way. Why you would start with a frozen brain and try to engineer an entire body to go with it when you could actually, if you have someone volunteer as a test subject, you could have them as they go through their life replace every failing part with an artificial organ, artificial limb, whatever it may be, until there's basically nothing left of their body, which almost sounds creepier in a way, but it would give them the opportunity to test and prove different things. Because to me, what, what bothers me about the whole situation, of course, there's a lot of things that are bothersome, but it... I wonder how on earth they're going to be able to adjust for the vast diff the vast array of different chemicals that interact with your brain. I can see them doing this and maybe succeeding in keeping a brain alive, but is that brain going to be sane? Is it going to be capable of the gambit of emotions? It what's going to happen on that front because it, it gets into some really sketchy territory with, you know, how much does your body biological functions come into play with how your brain is thinking and reacting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I just get scared anytime we decide to play with humanity and <laughs> synthetic things. Yes. It it is it is a scary topic i'll give you that but it's one of those things that sooner rather than later we are actually going to have to address because technology and innovation is to the point where we have to start asking ourselves these questions yeah true <laughs> oh man anywho you have got so much denial in your hand how many times have you frozen all of my characters? I don't know. A lot. <laughs> this is actually getting kind of annoying. That's what I live for. We're both trolls. Yeah, definitely. Which could potentially be a problem. Nah. 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 Totally not problematic. Okay. Your taunts might be problematic, but... For the wild. Keep throwing out that uh, Twilight Drake and it gets quite annoying. Okay, so that was actually one of the only interesting things that I read in the last week. There's been so much in the news recently about all of the different attacks and all of the political stuff going on because we are pushing into an election year. So the news has honestly been kind of depressing recently. We're being completely honest. <laughs> yeah, I don't watch the news. I don't know. I like to be informed, but at the same time, if all you'd ever do is read the news, you're probably uh, on, on well on the road to depression if you're not careful or anger. Just living mad the entire time. I will admit there was an interesting news thing a couple of weeks ago um, that I was thinking about for our last time and then we didn't cast at the end of the Thanksgiving week. But when there were um, the police raids in Brussels when they were looking for one of the terrorists from the Paris attacks, um, they had problems with with people posting on Twitter, like taking pictures of them, or wait, what is that card? It's one of the new ones. It's the genie. Haha, <laughs> get it? Haha. <laughs> well, no, that's just the Arab correct spelling of genie. Okay. Sorry. Um. Anyway, in <laughs> Brussels, they were having problems with people taking pictures of the police and their movements and um anyway so they turned the brussels the um the hashtags about the brussels pol police raid into a feed of cat pictures so everybody was posting pictures of cats that's 
kind of hilarious. Was it um, was it Twitter that did that? Um, I don't like Twitter didn't initiate it. I have no idea who initiated it. I just know that it happened. Hmm. That is that is kind of weird. But yeah, who doesn't like pictures of cute kittens? Well, I mean, it made sense because they were having problems with people, um, like with supposedly with terrorists being able to figure out where the police were or what was going on and they wanted to get rid of that problem so yeah it does make there sense you go. for sure social media has brought so many good things in and also so very many problems because yeah yeah I don't know. I think I think that a lot of the ways that it's been used recently have been pretty cool. But of course, there are always problems with it. Oh ho! Oh ho 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 ho! Oh ho! Oh ho! I have an awesome card. I don't like that. Bam! I have an ice howl. Well, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Babe, I think you're dead. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There have been some awesome things that have happened with social media, like the uh, the shelter offerings in France during the attacks a couple of weeks ago. And, um, of course, there's always charity stuff going on and all that kind of thing. But I don't know. There, there are always pros and cons to everything. And being so ridiculously interconnected does offer up some weird situations because you'll have a, the gray area between work and home life is getting larger and larger and larger. Because since so many people live on social media, it kind of introduces awkward situations where if you talk about your work on social media, is it your personal life or... Are you expressing your own opinions and that shouldn't be interfered with? Or is that something work should have control over because that reflects on your work? And that's kind of another whole topic that's somewhat bothered me in recent days. But I don't know that there really is a good solution to that one. I would like to point out that even though I'm going to die, it was very close. Yes, it was very close. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you do have a strong hand. I will give you that. Oh my goodness. Well, I can get rid of him. And I can get rid of him. And get rid of him. And that person. And play a free dragon. And a whole bunch of other crap. You're just showing off now. Maybe. Kind of a little bit. And you're dead. <laughs> All right. I think that's going to wrap us up for today. That is the one bad thing about this tavern brawl. It does take a lot it was longer really per game long. to play. Okay. It's well, fun, though. I like that brawl. Yeah. It, it is an interesting twist on the rule set for Hearthstone. Very, very, very different. Okay, guys. Well, that is the random topics ramble. So if you have any topics that you would like us to discuss next week, we would love to have you leave a comment down there. Um, just let us know about anything that you see that piques your interest, anything you want to hear our opinions on, because believe me, we are full, chock full of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and anyway, that is going to wrap us up. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.